Um, ihr kennt es, ich starte mal mit einer Frage. Uh, I, I really love the story of uh, Big Bad Wolves. Uh, what was your inspiration uh, for you and Nava to write this, this story? Um, we were doing the festival circuit with rabies. Um, we, have, we always have few ideas up our head, in our head. Um, it wasn't until we saw a Korean film called I Saw the Devil. Um, people say, I knew they had been inspired from that. Um, that all the pieces came together. We wanted to make, uh, at first we wanted to make a drama about a suspected pedophile, a teacher whose life is being shuttered because of the accusation, his wife doesn't want to talk to him, he's being fired from work. And then we say, okay, but that's only one film we want to do. Um, actually, we want to do another film about this Dirty Harry kind of a cop. Okay, that's two films. And why not throw it also a, a third uh, character about a vindictive father? I said, yeah, let's do all those three together. And we came to Hiluk and we said, imagine a Dirty Harry wandered by mistake to a Korean revenge thriller written by the brother Grimm. And he said, perfect, can you make it PG-13? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I said, okay, perfect, uh, it's still perfect. And that's how uh, the idea was conceived. Um, yeah. um, I mean, it's really interesting because um, apart from the little girls, they're only male characters. The women are just on the phone and quite bossy with, uh, with men. Why is that? <laughs> um, it's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> We love very complicated question. Um, no, it was very important for us to portray it, um, an allegory for, um, of course, an allegory for Israel, but I'll, I'll concentrate on the as, as story aspects of, of the film. Um, it's about child-like men who likes to play in their basement. It's like about a, um, a patriarchal uh, society of uh, very egomaniac uh, men who knows what to do. They're all ex-military. They all know how to make things right. Um, but eventually there are a bunch of little kids running around with no one to look after them. And we wanted to portray a very male dominant society, it's the way we see Israel is. And we wanted to keep the women out of the equation because as the way we see it, and it's a really feminist film, the way we see it, uh, <laughs> women would bring some uh, logic to the situation that would bring tender and I think it's something that Israel misses lately. I mean, all ex-military, um, a cop, they're all very, very, like, yeah. manly characters. And all the women are very caring, they're very, um, I mean, some, someone accused us of nagging, but yeah, they're caring, they make sure they take the medicine, they make sure we will we'll pick up the girl. Um, so it was very important for us to portray women as the sound of logic, as the sign of um, tenderness in a, in a very male-dominant egoistic society based on its military force. That's why they're all ex-military and... I mean, the film, the style is very minimalistic, yeah? So, so details really get a lot of weight or you, you have them so much in your, in your eyes. So I have to ask the, the uh, victim's father, he's wearing this jacket with this huge button. So I was just always thinking about what is this? <laughs> who bought this, you know? What, is there a story behind this? <laughs> Aaron would absolutely love your question. Aaron is a fanatic for uh, dressing, but actually the father was based um, in the, his appearance on my grandfather. Okay. My, uh, my okay. grandfather, he with the glasses and with the collar and it's like uh, very... Uh, um, but we wanted to make him look a bit like a kid. So it's two sizes bigger than him uh -huh. and makes him look a bit like uh, a teddy bear. And I remember Tzachi, the actor, he was struggling a lot to understand his character. I mean, he is a very methodical actor in Israel. And we went on the entire script with him. Um, line by line until he was very satisfied, but when he put the corduroy, he had to walk like this all of a sudden, he felt the character. Okay. So actually that gave him that final touch he needed. So I think you can see the, through on all the characters, I mean this is not usually how people dress in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the warmest we dress in Israel, I mean usually we go with flip-flops and sandals and t-shirts and we wanted to make a very wintry uh, kind of film to it, not to, not to, on, that it doesn't look like it's only could happen in Israel. So they're all wearing big coats and big um, big clothes. Want to make it very um, thick is the right word? Maybe, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. uh, um, heavy. Heavy <coughs> feeling. Mm -hmm. And maybe my 
last question. <coughs> uh, the ringtone, you know, by Kürenritt. Yeah. Why Wagner <laughs> on that mobile? <laughs> um, yeah, we wanted to make um, Sachi. I mean, all, all the characters, you kind of know their profession. I mean, uh, Mickey is a cop or an ex-cop. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Draw, the teacher, of course. Um, the grandfather, you kind of know, he was an ex-military guy. Um, and we kind of wanted to leave um, Gidi a kind of a mystery, because he looks like a very powerful man. He served with the chief of police. You know he's a very big influence man, and wanted to portray him very, very in a very, very strong and a bit of a fascist way. Um, so we really wanted him to, to have this car and this clothes, of a more high society. And the Valkyrie is just something that um, maybe in our heads uh, symbolizes power, um, total power. And of course, it also resonates with uh, Wagner and. In many ways, it also resonates with Apocalypse Now. I mean, you can't really take the connection out mm -hmm. of what we grew up as kids and hearing those helicopters. Yeah, and it's so strong. And yeah, of course, this guy also has a Glock as a gun. And we, we can talk a lot about the German aspect of this guy. But <laughs> <laughs> OK, any comments or questions from, from you? Don't be shy. Yeah. Is there an, a political message with the Arabian cowboy? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, always. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I can do it on um, There is always two kinds of Arabs in Israel's films the terrorist kind or the victim kind. I mean, they're all very straight up, very cliches. Um, and first of all, I have to say, we wanted to make an entertaining film, a popcorn film, which I saw a lot of people bringing popcorn to the film, and I said, yeah, it's a popcorn <laughs> film. First of all, film should be entertaining and not about education. And throughout the years, Israel has been known for very um, important films about this situation, and films that you could only read the synopsis and you wouldn't have to see the film, because the message is so out there. Um, not that there isn't a place for films like that, but Israeli industry was all about that. And we grew up in the 80s. I mean, MTV came to Israel, two, two channels came to Israel. For us, it was like a revolution. Um, we grew up on uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and Scorsese and De Palma and, and so on. So and we wanted to make films that we would like to watch. So we did Rabies, and now we did this. But you can't get away from the political um, state that you are into. And we wanted to, and we always thought, why there are only two representations of our, maybe we are um, uh, making it internal, uh, those two situations, by showing only those two situations, only the terrorist or the victim. If we keep showing only those two situations, maybe it will stay like this. We said, let's make the Arab guy. The only sane guy in the whole <laughs> <laughs> The simplest guy is the nicest guy, the down-to-earth guy. He just happened to be there. And we said, okay, that would be a nice surprise for the audience. In the middle of torture, people uh, putting up nails. An Arab guy will come. And probably the audience, oh, no, they're they going to take that. What's going to happen with the Arab guy? He wants a cigarette. <laughs> and, and we kind of imagined it as a, a Western scene. Where you have the cowboys sitting on the sport and the Indian comes and they share a peace pipe. And of course there is, if you want to be very intellectual about it, and he wants a cigarette, but he doesn't want a whole cigarette, he could use only a puff. I mean, we really went into very subtle stuff there that looks very normal. And actually, Israeli people doesn't see that uh, as, an, uh, as a, a very political statement. For them it's, oh, okay, he looks like an Arab guy just having a smoke. But now that I've been to, um, we've been around and we've been to Berlin yesterday, I love it that you, you get those details because you see it from another perspective and you can see how much it was important for us, even though we thought it was very subtle. Um, and then we said, okay, but we don't want to put it only for, uh, for fun. You know, it's not, we are not only, not only for the filmmakers' sake. So we put it in the end as a payoff, as the guy who actually rescues the situation or hands out the phone. Um, the iPhone. The iPhone. The SR, S4. Um, so it was very important for us to, to, to use an Arab character, which we didn't do in Rabies. Rabies were all Israeli guys killing Israeli guys. 
and with no Arab representation whatsoever. Um, Big Bad Bulls echoes to Ray in the statement that we really believe that before we can solve any conflict with the Palestinian side, we have so many conflicts among ourselves um, that we need to solve before. I mean, we shouldn't point, um, point fingers to blame on the Palestinian side until we solve all our fucking problems, sorry, all our problems in Israel. We should solve them first and then approach um, a peace. So um, the problem starts within and that's why you have three Israeli guys in a basement surrounded by Arabs and the Arabs are the normal, normal ones. Yeah, yeah they also maybe thought of uh, having a more open ending where you don't um, give the teacher the, the blame. A perfect yes, question. Because now it's also kind of justification for all the violence. That's exactly, that's exactly, um, that was our biggest question in the script, I have to admit. And that's a perfect question, I really am glad you asked it. We, there are two, two situations, where there is an open question, and then what we thought, the moral is very simple. Three people took revenge on the wrong guy, violence leads to horrible consequences. I think that's something that we thought wasn't a very responsible thing to say because we thought maybe it's obvious, maybe it's been said enough times that violence and vengeful and taking the, your uh, law to your own hands leads to terrible consequences. And we wanted to raise another question. Now that you know he's done it, as a viewer, as an audience, now that you know he's done it, now that you know that actually they had the right guy and they killed the killer, are you still cheering for them, for what they did. Are, are you still justifying their revenge? Because by taking their revenge, they probably killed another girl. So the violence will always continue, but now you have to ask yourself, am I justifying that? Um, I think it was the biggest uh, dilemma we had, morally, and that's the reason why we decided to end on this note. Because we don't see them as, um, I mean, we weren't celebrating it's not like they're um, victorious about it. It's not like they're cheering. Yeah, we got the right guy. We killed. We have our vengeance. It ends on a very dark note. And that's something that was very important for us, not to go out from the theater. Okay, we just saw a very violent film. Yeah, you have to see this very violent, gory film. No, the dark note and the way that you need to criticize the right people. The, you know, they were correct. It was very important for us. It's a small question. Um, for your serial killer, was he based on a true story? Is there a, a serial killer? I story? hope Is not. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope not. Um, pedophile is not a, that big of an issue in Israel. And I think that was one of the reasons we wanted to deal in this matter. Because that's, if it was a big issue, like I know there are countries where it's more big of an issue, um, it wouldn't be allegory wouldn't be so strong um, about people ruining their life kids by trying to protect their life kids by, I mean, we grew up in a very, um, in a very intense environment, you might have heard about. Um, we are surrounded by Arab countries, we have a large legacy of being um, hunted or being present. And we grew up with this survival instinct that you have to survive, no matter what, you have to, Protect your children, no matter what. I mean, the, the, the Jewish mother, you can hear on the phone, it's like a very strong instinct in, in the family, in the Israeli family. You, have to, you will do anything for your kids. I remember my father growing, um, our fathers, and Aaron's not here, but Aaron's father was uh, a warrior. He had a warrior in the army, he's been to two wars, he's injured, he's, he's like a, a veteran, he's very, has medals. We grew up with superhero fathers who went to war to protect us. Every year they went for one month to the reserve. So, and growing up in Israel, it was always waiting for your father to come back with the uniforms and pick you up in the air. It was like, that, that was life in Israel. And sometimes you go maybe too far in, in the name of the kids, in the name of protecting them. Um, you do horrible stuff in the name of justifying, protecting your, your kind, or revenging them. And we choose that subject matter because it deals with the father issue, with being a father, a relationship, father and son, father and daughters in Israel, and because it doesn't based on true story, 
So it will be more of an allegory, more of a symbolic to what's, what we feel is a big issue in Israel. Well. Um, the, um, with rabies, I, I said before it was the first uh, Israeli horror movie, now uh, it's the second one. Uh, what was the reaction uh, on Big Bang Wolves in Israel and uh, what is the influence that you're doing this now as it's new territory? Okay. Uh, first of all, you remind me something I wanted to say. Yeah. Two years ago we were here with rabies and actually we didn't know what to expect. It was the first time we screened the film. And to a German audience, and as, as I told you before, it was a mind-blowing experience meeting the German audience. We've never expected him to connect to, to us in that way. I mean, you get us, and you, you really, you really get us, and that was very unique for us. And I'm not sure if you're aware for us, but it was not as simple to get big bad wolves here this year. But we fought about it, um, and it was super important to us. There are, I think, three film festivals that we feel kind of discovered us. Um, it was uh, Fantasia in Canada, who really kind of discovered us. It was, I'm, I'm only saying it chronologically. Um, it was Fright Fest in London, and it's Fantasy Film Fest. So we feel like, for us, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to say it before the film, so you wouldn't, oh, so we gotta love him now, we gotta love his film now. But now that you've stayed, it was very important for me to say that we really fought, and for Dick knows and Philip knows how much uh, Fantasy Film Fest wanted this film, and how much Aaron and I wanted the film to be here. And so a lot of things started um, with rabies here. I mean, the way that um, it echoed back in Israel was amazing. <laughs> And Rabies really opened a new generation of filmmakers who finally understood, hey, can we, can we do not only political films? Hmm, that's, that's strange. There are festivals with audiences from outside Israel that would love to see our little horror films. Amazing. And Rabies was a huge success on the international market, so we had less difficult to finance Big Bad Wolves. And now that Big Bad Wolves got all the attention and bought by Magnolia, to a to, um, US distributor and uh, the UK by Metrodome. It's a total different thing in Israel. I mean, we've been nominated for 11 Israeli Oscars for a horror film. Uh, <laughs> we don't tell in Israel it's a horror film. We call it a revenge thriller. Um, so it will be easier for the, uh, for the Israeli audience to, which I think is, is correct. It's not horror film per se. But uh, we have to help the Israeli audience to get this genre knowledge a bit. Um, so now things are completely changed. The, the, the journey that Big Bad Wolves is now doing and the way it's been received around the world really opened up a lot of new filmmakers and the, uh, old filmmaker, filmmakers who really want to make genre films right now. So watch out because you're going to get, I think, like a flood of Israeli genre <laughs> films in the next few years. And yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I see you two going to Hollywood at one point. Please don't make it too soon. And please don't make the remake, yeah, from Big Bad Wolves. But, <laughs> but I think it has remake potential. Uh, uh, can you see that as an American movie? I mean, you would have changed the tone completely. Um, really <laughs> Were you ask already? <laughs> no, I mean, well, first of all, we feel obligated to keep uh, on doing films in Israel. I mean, it's all, it's something started with Big Bad Wolves, and we feel like, now with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, we feel like we should keep supporting the industry in Israel and actually we have um, an next project planned in Israel called Once Upon a Time in Palestine. It's a, uh, it's a spaghetti western taking place during the British occupation of Israel in the 40s. Uh, it was a crazy period of time. Actually we were the terrorists back then killing British left and right, putting bombs in coffers, trying to keep the British out. Um, all of them became prime ministers and presidents later. And it's a subject matter that no one ever done, obviously. Um, so that's like a big spaghetti western. We want to do kind of an inglorious bastard. Um, Philip is or has already said yes to produce that. Philip, yeah. Philip yeah. says yes in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Hilik is, is a huge fan. Um, so, yeah, we're going to do that. We feel obligated. But, uh, yeah, the offers are coming. But, I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if, yeah. We're going to take part in the next ABCs of Death. Um, we're going to uh, do a short segment for them. 
but um, which letter? Uh, we can't say. <laughs> they told. I mean, it, this time it came with such a manifest. I had lawyers going over it just to make sure no one does a legal mistake. I mean, they are really, really secretive about it. But uh, it should be ready. I mean, we should. I mean, we should have started filming it because the deadline is approaching. But um, it will be soon enough, I guess. So, möchte jemand noch ein letztes Kommentar vielleicht geben? Dann sagen wir Tschüss und da kommt noch, ja? Uh, I love the music. It was great. Um, it was big bad music, I think. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, it was, actually, I think, um, from the start, we knew we wanted to do something very Carter Borgel, Bernard Herrmann kind of a theme. Something that, that's never been done in Israel. A lot of Israeli films, when you listen to them, you can see some music going on in the background. Maybe someone just leaned over a synthesizer or something like that. You don't want the music to interfere with the film. It's all about the, the story. And we said, no, we want the music. Like, if you do the fifth character, people would go out of the studio and do like, like that. Like Martin McFly in Back to the Future, when he puts his guitar and people just jumping out. And actually, it happened in Fight Fest, the volume of six. It shouldn't be loud, people what? sitting like that. Um, and we approached Frank Elfman, which also, or, or also did the music for Redis. And he did record the music for Redis like that. He we entered the room and said, Yeah, yeah, you can come in, I'm just recording the nice. Sit down, sit down, I'm just finishing. I said, You're not going to get away with it that easy this time. And we worked like for four months on this piece, and eventually we recorded it in Air Studios in London with the London Metropolitan, where they recorded Inception and um, with the band of uh, that recorded Kick Ass, and it was like a really huge effort. And we have to thank Kidik for that because that's one of a one I have of a hell of a soundtrack, and it's going to go out I think in the next few weeks. You can you can buy it, but it was really an effort. No one really put so much effort in, in big soundtracks, orchestral soundtracks anymore, and we wanted to take it to the 70s again. So that was the Actually, the, four, uh, the first four minutes, I think, with the reverse voice playing hide and seek was great. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll tell Frank you. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much. It uh, was really great.